All right, Crystal, what's on your radar? Well, friends, we gather for a somber occasion. Time to mourn the death of another terrible pundit talking point. <laughs> Not that they'll ever, ever acknowledge that they were wrong or even change their terrible talking points. In fact, continuing to spew the debunked dead talking points will most likely get you a raise or even a primetime show, but never you mind about that. All right, so here it is. From the moment that Trump was elected, a debate has raged within Democratic Party circles about the nature of his voters and what would be the best way to ultimately defeat him. One side argued that since some portion of Trump supporters were won over by his anti-establishment approach and populist economic positions on trade and other issues, they could be won back by economic messaging and by pointing out how Trump had failed on core economic promises. The other side argued that the only reason anyone voted for Trump was white supremacy, that every single Trump voter was an unreachable racist robot, and that to even try to understand motivations other than racism makes you yourself problematic. You'll recall, of course, Hillary's basket of deplorables comment from 2016, in which she actually argued that only half were deplorable and the other half were struggling. <laughs> now the deplorable segment has been stretched to encompass every one of the roughly 70 percent of eligible voters who did not cast a ballot ultimately for Hillary Clinton. You might think that I'm caricaturing this view, but really, I swear I am not. Huffington Post reporter Dan Marins ran into this very smart argument this week when he penned what was an insightful article about the ways in which the reality of Trump in office has been very different from what was proffered in 2016 on the issue of economics. For his efforts, he was trashed by liberals online and informed by the sage Democratic strategist Tom Watson that, quote, no sentient being believed any of this bullshit. Now, oftentimes, the lines of this battle ended up being about whether to try to win back Obama-Trump voters or try to excite the base. For what it's worth, I have always believed that this was a false choice and that you could both excite the progressive base and win back some slice of white working class Trump voters with an economic populist message. Bernie's 2016 campaign, for example, in particular, showed a lot of promise in that department. Well, lo and behold, in the heart of the industrial Midwest, new data is in that shows, without a doubt, that some portion of Trump voters were in fact winnable and have in fact been won. And let's keep in mind that they have been won over by an exceptionally uninspiring candidate with an exceptionally uninspiring message. Just imagine what could happen if Democrats actually decided to offer an FDR style economic agenda to voters who are desperate for it right now. All right, I'll pause the snark. Here are the numbers. New York Times has some new polling in Michigan and Wisconsin, and you will not be shocked to learn that it is not looking great for President Trump there. These are both states, you'll recall, that he won last time around and which had some of the strongest affinity for his populist messaging on trade and manufacturing in particular. In Michigan, the latest poll has Trump going from a less than one point win in 2016 to an eight point loss today. In Wisconsin, the latest poll has Trump going from a less than one point win to a 10 point loss today. But the New York Times also did a more wholesale evaluation of the six industrial Midwestern states that they have polled to date. So overall, they found that the voters they polled had backed Trump by about 2.6 points back in 2016, which is exactly consistent with Trump's, Trump's win number, which seems to indicate they had a pretty good sample going. But this time around, those same voters who supported Trump again by about three points last time are now backing Biden by about six points. So here's Nate Cohn on Twitter. Let's take a look at this. Joe Biden leads in time Siena polls of the Northern Battlegrounds by six points this fall, even though our respondents said they voted for Trump by three points three year, four years ago. How? The president faces modest but significant defections. Alone, voters flipping from Trump to Biden versus Clinton to Trump turned the president's three-point lead among 2016 voters into a three-point deficit, giving Biden a comfortable lead in the region without any change in turnout or gains among minor party voters. Now, Biden is also overwhelmingly winning third party voters and people who didn't vote last time, accounting for his eight and 10 point margins in Wisconsin and Michigan and six point lead overall in the industrial Midwest. But isn't it interesting that he has actually been able to eat into that vaunted Trump base? It's almost like the assumption that the white working class Trump base was uniquely unmovable was based on deep classism that assumed voters without a college degree were uniquely dumb and uniquely racist. It's almost like the journalists who overwhelmingly populate our newsrooms have a completely caricaturish view of much of the population <laughs> and do not want or care to actually understand their lives and their motivations. Now that I think about it, 
It's almost like shutting down any conversation that didn't start and end with a rock solid belief that every single Trump voter is irredeemably racist was a cute ploy to keep from ever examining the failures of neoliberalism. Today, Joe Biden could be on track for a landslide victory, basically doing very little. As I've said here repeatedly, it is pathetic that he can be in this position based on a stirring campaign of wearing a mask and promising to send nicer tweets. But the reason Biden is well positioned is a good one in a certain sense. People are not the cultish automatons that many said they were. Sure, they didn't give a shit about Russiagate or Ukraine Gate or Trump's attacks on the norms and the guardrails. <laughs> but when it came down to their lives and their livelihoods, plenty decided that they had in fact seen enough. They were sentient beings and they no longer believed Trump's bullshit. I just find it so fascinating, too, that people will look at this data. People have been spouting this the whole time. Don't even bother trying to reach them. They're unreachable. They'll never change their minds. They're cult. You know, they're following their cult leader. They will never acknowledge the fact that just with the most basic messaging to this group of people, Biden has been able to win over some significant and potentially determinative number. Nobody has ever been able to square for me how millions of people who voted for Barack Hussein Obama, our first black president, are somehow racist white supremacists who then voted for Donald Trump. It was almost of this. Oh, and Bernie Sanders, actually, in the same exact in the same exact counties and places. It has actually the most determinative thing for all of these counties is the number of jobs shipped to China yeah. as a result of permanent normal trade relations. It's that simple, but nobody wants to have that conversation. And it's like you said, look, it, like the idea, I don't think there's a lot of misunderstanding here, too, which is that the Republican base is not white working class people. It's not voters in Michigan and Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. Those people didn't vote Republican for a reason. The Republican base are basically boomers who watch Fox News. <laughs> now, saying that those people, maybe 28 percent of the electorate country or whatever, is the entire Republican Party is ridiculous because 63 million people voted for Donald Trump last time. Yeah. That's a lot of people. That means there's coalition evangelicals, and yes, white working class voters. So I think it has been a dramatic disservice to these voters and to our entire national public conversation, not to just parse out what I just talked about here. It's like with Democrats. I mean, the idea that the only base of the Democratic Party are the suburban white liberals, no, what we talk about, which is that they're the ones who are catered to the most and they set the cultural taste making. It's also older black people. Yeah. And it's also, you know, older people who have just voted within communities that way for a long time, young people as well. And so trying to paint a broad brush in that regard is just ridiculous. And you have to look at and see which are the coalitions which you can try to win over. This is with the great swing coalitions in America right now and has been broadly since the last like 40, 50 years. Yeah. And nobody ever like spoke to them until Trump kind of came around. Everyone took them for granted. And then the Democrats, you know, by virtue of Trump's idiocy, really have lost them. But I still think it's a very open grab, right? Like nobody's learned that lesson. What has Biden learned? That he can just say, wear a mask <laughs> and that I won't cut your tax Taxes to the richest people in America, and, and, and I, he can win. I should say, I do think that, especially in probably Michigan, Wisconsin, there is some lingering goodwill around Biden because of the auto bailout. Totally. And so totally. I think, you know, in addition to the really lackluster and embarrassingly like low bar campaign that he's running and right now has the largest lead of any challenger since 1936, I do think there is some goodwill lingering there that in order to his benefit that the Trump campaign has done absolutely nothing effectively to pierce. The other piece of this debate, though, that I sort of reject wholesale is implicit in this idea of like the, well, screw those white working class people, like why are we even bothering with them, is this idea that your policy should be determined by who you want to pander to yeah, of course. versus like what would be in the best interest of the country. Right. That's one of the things that has been most disturbing to me about the Democratic Party trajectory in the Trump era and why I really have sort of separated myself from that party, frankly, is because this mentality took hold where it was like, we're going to pick and choose who we even care about, who we who deserves empathy, who deserves like just a basic fair shot, who we think is getting short on the stick. We're going to pick and choose which ones we actually care about. And to me, that view is absolutely anathema if you actually care about people just having a fair shot yes. to earn a decent living in this country and have basic you know, economic dignity, whether it's health care or wages or labor rights or any of that. And so 
Anyway, I think that this polling and the revelation that, in fact, people are paying attention. In fact, people do have a good sense of what policies and what lack of leadership impacts, how it impacts their lives. I think that people should take note of that and actually think about how you might do more to appeal to people and their economic interests. Because we also looked at the research like, if you're just if you just care about power and all you care about is winning, the messages that land the most effectively are on healthcare yes. and jobs and wages, which should be so obvious, but apparently has not been obvious for some time now. It's for a crazy. Lot of it's just so crazy. Look, people care a lot about politics. They just don't care about politics the way that the elites care about politics, mm-hmm. and that's what drives the elites crazy. I think that's right. Yeah. Still to come, day two of Amy Coney Barrett's confirmation hearing set to begin later today. D.C. Bureau Chief of the Intercept Brian Grimm is going to weigh in on the Democrats' strategy moving forward when rising returns. 